Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Organic 101 webinar brought to you by OATS. Um, thank you all so much for joining today. Um, I am Mallory Krieger. I'm the National Program Director with OATS, and I am going to be your trainer today for this webinar. Um, I would like to give a huge shout out of thanks to U the USDA Transition to Organic Partnership Program, aka TOP, um, particularly the West and Southwest region. Um, they are the funders of this webinar. It's through um, their support that we've been able to bring this program to you today. A um, little bit about OATS before we dive into our main topic. So um, OATS is the Organic Agronomy Training Service. We are a nonprofit that is fiscally sponsored by the Organic Trade Association. And our mission is to train agronomists, farmers, and other service providers in the art and science of organic crop production. And we do this work because we want to see every transitional and certified organic farmer um, having robust access to technical service expertise, uh, particularly uh, with unbiased science-based information. Some programs I'd like to highlight of, uh, that OATS does is um, we um, have put together a number of online courses as well as some programs that um, we conduct with the aim of um, letting people from all across the country access our information. So um, our main course that we run is the Organic Field Crop course, and I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. We also have a new course up on our catalog called Crop Insurance for Organics. And it is a free course. If you go to our website, I'll drop the link in the chat in a moment. But um, it's got great information on crop insurance topics for organic farmers and advisors. We also host field days and workshops periodically throughout the country. And we have a um, listserv online called the Organic Advisor Listserv. If you want to join that, you can navigate to our homepage at organicagronomy.org. And that is a place where you can ask questions of fellow advisors. If you got run into something that's interesting or a sticky question, it's a great place to shoot your question onto the listserv and you can get some answers. Uh, once a month, we host a call series called the Organic Advisor Call Series, where we have guests from across the organic industry come on and talk about a topic near and dear to them. Our next um, it, our next session is tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Central Time. You can find more information about that on our website. And finally, we also have a podcast called The Dirt on Organic Farming. Our first season was on um, six common myths about organic production. And um, our next season is dropping next month, and it is on um, organic crop insurance topics. Our main course that we offer is the Organic Field Crop course. It is a video-based learning experience where you can work through 48 video lessons organized into 12 modules at your own pace. And then once a month for six months, you meet with a cohort of your peers with, and a facilitator for two hour live sessions where guest speakers and organic farmers come on the call and share information about topics that they are experts in to help supplement the video materials. And also, it, those live sessions are a space for the cohort to get their questions answered and to interact with each other and to grow their network. This course is um, built out of research-supported, expert-vetted science-based material. It covers the basics of organic production, including weed control, nutrient management, crop rotation, et cetera. But it also covers systems thinking and long-term strategies for success, managing risk during transitions, certification and record keeping, marketing and profitability, among other topics. Our goal is for this course to be a holistic, um, to provide a holistic understanding of organic crop production so that farmers who are working with the advisors that go through this course are um, best served. Uh, we have two cohorts that are starting in December. The first one is facilitated by Leah Varik. Some of you may know Leah. She used to work as a research assistant at University of Wisconsin-Madison in Aaron Silva's lab, working primarily on roller crimped rye, soybean um, 
organic production. Um, she has since moved into a role as the as one of the consultants working in the Rodale Institute consultant pool. And she focuses on the Midwest and Colorado areas. Leia is a wealth of knowledge and a fantastic facilitator. Uh, deadline to enroll in her cohort is December 17th of this year. So just a few weeks away. Anyone can enroll in this cohort. We do have scholarships available for those who are in need. If you find yourself in need of a scholarship, do contact me. Um, at training at organicagronomy.org, and I can um, get you hooked up with that. We also have a tuition waiver program for this cohort available for ag professionals who are working in the West Southwest region of TOP. So those states include Texas, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, and Utah. So big thanks to TOP for the tuition waiver program there. So if you are an ag professional in the Southwest region and would like to sign up for this cohort, email me at training at organicagronomy.org to receive a coupon code to collect your tuition waiver. We also have a cohort um, for Indiana that is um, facilitated by Ashley Adair. Deadline to enroll for that is December 19th. And um, enrollment for this is restricted to ag professionals who are working in Indiana. So if you are an Indiana-based ag professional, um, shoot me an email. We'll get you a coupon code. We do have a tuition waiver program available for that cohort as well, um, funded by Indiana SARE. So that brings us to today. Um, our agenda is to um, go over the USDA National Organic Program certification process. Then we will discuss land eligibility and the top regulations that every advisor should know. And then we will do a breakout session um, where we will do an ac activity on the organic regulations called the Organic Regulations Scavenger Hunt. And then we'll have some time to discuss that breakout activity as a group. And then we will um, conclude our session with a talk on allowed and prohibited materials. So before we dive into the material, I would love to get to know who all is in the room right now. So I'm going to launch a poll so that we can get an idea of who we have in the room. So if you would take a moment, it's five short questions. This is a poll about kind of who you are, and it also has some pre-evaluation questions to help us um, gauge whether we were effective with this training. And you can take just a minute and answer these questions. I'll give you about two minutes to do it, and then we will dive into the materials. All right, I'm going to end the poll now, and I'll share the results. So looks like we have a pretty even split. Um, there are about 14 people, 15 people who are on the call today. We do have 50 people registered, so I expect we'll see a few more join as the meeting goes and even more people watching the recording. Um, and so we have about a third of our uh, participants are ag agronomists slash advisors, a third from extension, a third from nonprofit, and one person from a government position. And then in terms of geographic distribution, we have um, about half of our participants from the Midwest Great Plains region region and about half from the Southwest. Um, thank you very much for filling out that poll. I'm going to go ahead and navigate back to my slides and we will get started on our regulations discussion. So organic agriculture, organic production, what is it? We are here today to talk about USDA organic certification. So this is the national organic program governed by um, the USDA. According to the USDA regulation, section 205.2, organic production is defined as a production system that responds to site-specific conditions by integrating cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that foster the cycling of, of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. So according to this definition, it is a suite of production practices that is aiming to both grow food and to steward the environment. Organic agriculture is defined, regulated, and protected by the USDA. It is the only agricultural production system in the United States that is verified 
uh, that is protected by law and third-party verified. There are other third-party verified labels. There are other labels that have standards that are governed by organizations or individuals, but this is the only one that is protected by the force of law. So let's look at how it is structured. The USDA National Organic Program is housed within the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service. It establishes um, the NOP is the NOP's role is to establish the regulations and to accredit third party certifiers. The NOP within USDA does not create the law and it does not inspect farms. It is the top layer of the regulatory system. It works with a group called the National Organic Standards Board, which is a citizen advisory body who help inform updates and changes to the regulations, which are essentially the interpretation of the law that is passed by Congress. NOP, through its duty to accredit third-party certifiers, is the enforcement arm of the law. So it enforces compliance with the law by way of its accrediting and auditing function with certifiers. The middlemen in the certification um, system are the accredited certifying agents. Sometimes they're referred to as ACAs, other times they're, and most of the times, referred to as certifiers. The certifiers are the ones that actually certify that operations are in compliance with the regulations. They do this by collecting records and sending inspectors out to the farms. Um, and the records that they collect are namely the Organic System Plan or OSP. I'll talk a little bit more about OSP in a minute, but the Organic System Plan in a nutshell is a, is a document that details everything about a farm's production plan and activities. Everything from their field activities to their inputs, to their seed purchases, to their marketing and sales. The certifiers collect that document, review it, review reports in, um, given to them by their inspectors, and then determine whether or not the farm is in compliance. If they are in compliance, then they issue the certificate. If they are not in compliance, then they address that with the farm. The third cast, the, the third character in this cast of characters is the inspector. Inspectors are hired by the certifiers. Some inspectors are staff inspectors with the certifiers, and some are third-party inspectors that are hired as contractors by the certifiers. But the certifier, regardless of how they hire them, is who the inspector is working for. The inspector visits a fa the farm annually, verifies that the farm is following its OSP. So they do an on-site inspection. They look at every field. They look at all of the farm's records on site. They look in their barns, at their equipment, at their, at their um, inventory of inputs and seeds and stored harvests, verifying that all of what they see is in compliance with the National Organic Program rules and regulations and is accurate as documented in the farm's organic system plan. The inspector then writes up a report of their findings and submits it to the certifier who reviews it and makes the certification decision. Inspectors do not make decisions, inspectors observe and report. So who are the certifiers? This is a small selection of a large number of certifiers that work in the United States and are accredited by the National Organic Program. To find a full, a full list of certifiers, you can navigate to the link that I have just sent to you in the chat. This link is to the National Organic Program website in the Agricultural Marketing Service Division of the Department of Agriculture. And at that link, you can click the button Organic Certifier Locator. And that takes you to a portion of the Organic Integrity Database. The Organic Integrity Database is maintained by the National Organic Program at USDA. It contains vital information like location, operator, uh, operator name, products, et cetera, of all certified operations and hand certified production operations like farms and handling operations, uh, as well as the information on every accredited certifier um, in the United States. So you can run a search using the filters at the top 
for the state that you're interested in. And make sure that under the find a certifier with, I'll get my laser pointer out here, under the heading find a certifier with, with, make sure to select operations because that shows you the state that they have operations that they certify in. That'll allow you to see who works in the state that you are interested in learning about. So the certification process is an annual process. When a farm is first entering certification, they, um, well, when they first enter organics, they have to go through a transition process. The last prohibited material is applied on the farm and the farm must record the date. Then they have to wait 36 months, which is the required transition period from that date of last prohibited input. Once they are about one year away from the eligibility date, a farm then starts shopping for a certifier. They can start earlier than that, but many certifiers aren't uh, don't have the capacity to walk farms through a transition and will ask farms to reach back out to them when they're at that one year date from their eligibility. So they contact the certifier, get the necessary paperwork. They get, they get the OSP forms from their certifier of choice and any additional application forms that they need. And they can take some time to fill that out. Applications for certification usually happen the winter before the eligibility date for row crop operations that plant in the spring and harvest in the fall for livestock operations or specialty crop operations that have a more annualized uh, year round calendar that application can happen at a different time. Um, but, but the certifier will inform the, the farm when is best for them to submit their application in their unique situation. So once the farm applies, then the initial inspection is conducted. So the certifier will do an initial review of the file. They will ensure that the farm it likely meets the organic um, eligibility requirements. And then they dispatch a inspector to go out to the farm and conduct the first inspection. The first inspection must happen when the crop is growing that they that the farm wants to sell as organic. They have the inspector has to be able to see that they do in fact grow that crop in that field. So for example, if the first crop they want to harvest organic is corn, then the inspector would need to go out and see that corn is growing on their field that they applied for at an appropriate time of year. The initial inspection also allows the certifier to know whether the farm is implementing the OSP properly. What they had submitted with their application is that actually what's happening on the farm. And then the inspector also does an audit of the farm's records. They do an exercise called a trace back and an exercise called a mass balance. And that is done at every inspection. Once the inspection is complete, the inspector will write up their report, submit it to the certifier, who will then conduct the review and come to their decision. This will occur before first harvest or sale. A farm is not able to sell their crop as organic until they have their certificate um, decision letter in hand. Once they have that certificate in hand, they can sell that crop and the cycle begins again. Um, organic operates, operates on an annual basis. And so every year, a certified organic farm will need to submit their um, renewal application uh, to the certifier and they will be inspected again and get a new certificate for that year. So more details about the organic system plan. The organic system plan is uh, requirements are detailed in section 205.201 of the organic regulations. The regulations state that an OSP must contain a description of all production practices and procedures, including the frequency. So how often do, does the farm till? What tillage methods do they use? What seeds do they plan to plant? When do they plan to plant them? what inputs do they want to play, uh, to apply and when. It also must contain a list of all material inputs it, and that must be the input itself, the manufacturer um, and the planned application method. 
The OSP contains a description of the record keeping system that the farm keeps, as well as practices to prevent contamination and commingling. Any additional information that is required by the certifier is also included in these list of requirements. So a certifier may impose additional record keeping um, requirements on the farms they certify so long as it is necessary for them to verify compliance with the National Organic Program rules and regulations. And finally, there is a whole section of this regulation pertaining specifically to producer groups. So any producer groups, any co-ops um, that um, co-produce or co-market have um, a particular set of requirements with their OSP that documents their internal control system. So it documents who the decision makers are, how decisions are made, how conflicts of interest are avoided, how prices are negotiated, et cetera. Um, the regulations do directly stipulate that a farm may substitute another plan prepared for another government regulatory program in place of the OSP, so long as that plan meets all of the requirements that are laid out in section 205-201. So if a farm goes through a CAP 138 planning process with NRCS, or their individual state has a planning requirement, as long as that plan meets the list of requirements in 205-201, they may submit that in lieu of the OSP document. So requirements for organic certification. The requirements for organic certification are located um, in seven Code of Federal Regulations, part 205, the National Organic Program. And I'm going to chat the link directly to the organic regulations to you now. So as we're going through the slides, if you want to be able to reference what I'm talking about directly in the regulations, you can. So I'd like to start with land requirements because everything starts with the land in organics. Organics is done on a per field basis. And so everything that we talk about with the land has to be documented at the individual field level. 205, section 205, 202 outlines the requirements for each parcel of land that want that. Uh, for that the requirements that each parcel of land must meet in order to be certified organic. We are going to go through each of these sections in turn, but I'm not going to do them in order. I'm going to save section A for last because it has more meat in it. So we're going to start with section B, subsection B. 205-202 subsection B states that for a parcel of land to be certified organic, it must have had no prohibited substances applied to it for a period of three years, which equals 36 months, immediately preceding the harvest of the crop. So let's break that down. No prohibited substances applied for 36 period, 36 month period is typically called transition. Now, some parcels of land won't go through a traditional transition. For example, if a parcel of land has been in CRP management for the last 10 years and has had a, no prohibited substances applied, when, a, when it comes out of CRP, the farmer can put it directly into organic because that 36 month transition period has already elapsed, even though the farmer didn't initiate it necessarily intentionally. It was part of how the land was already being managed. But for land that has been managed conventionally prior to wanting to go into to certification, um, it has to go through the 36 month transition period, which just means no prohibited substances have been applied. Um, organic transition starts on the day of the last prohibited input application. The producer must document that date in their farm records, and this will be audited at that initial inspection. The first organic harvest happens after the third anniversary of that date. So for example, if a, on a field, the last prohibited input application was a synthetic substance applied on October 27th, 2020, then a corn crop that is planted the spring of the third year of transition in April of 2023 can be certified organic as long as it is harvested after that anniversary date. 
So a crop can be planted in transition and harvested as organic so long as the harvest happens after the three-year anniversary of the last prohibited input application. The next section of the land requirements have to do with buffer zones. Every parcel must have distinct defined boundaries and buffer zones so that um, it prevents the unintended application of a prohibited substance to the crop or contact with a prohibited substance that was applied to adjoining land that is not under organic management. So let's break this down. We have to have defined and distinct boundaries. That means that every field, aka farm parcel, can be identified visually by the inspector. If the inspector goes out to the farm, they can look at it and say, okay, that's the boundary of the field. That boundary can be a fence row, it could be a corner stake, it could be a flag, it can be any number of ways that a boundary is visually distinct so that the inspector knows they are looking at the, at the field in question. Now on to the buffer zones. The buffer zones are intended to hedge against contamination and commingling. Uh, so the contam common sources of contamination for a field include genetic drift and pesticide and herbicide drift. Genetic drift is when genetically engineered pollen blows in on the wind from a neighboring farm. We see this most commonly in places where wind pollinated genetically engineered crops are grown like corn. So here where I am located in the Midwest in Illinois, we have lots and lots of conventional genetically engineered corn in production. And so that pollen is out blowing in the wind. If it pollinates the organic corn stand, then that is considered a drift or a contamination of a prohibited um, substance, which is the genetically engineered genes in that pollen. Pesticide and herbicide drift is when a pesticide or herbicide physically drifts across the boundary from where it is being applied on a conventional field into the organic field, or when it volatilizes due to certain weather patterns, it becomes a mist that floats up into the air and can travel many miles around the area and then drop down onto an organic farm. Both of those are um, forms of drift. Now, buffer zones can be used to protect against particulate drift that moves across the boundary of a field from where it is being applied. So if there's a, a um, ground sprayer spraying on a cornfield to the east, the buffer zone can catch the um, wind that blows that part, um, ap applied uh, pesticide in, onto the organic field. There is unfortunately not much that can be done to protect against volatilization uh, because that can come from so far away. Buffer zones really don't um, unfortunately have an effect on volatilized um, substances like 2,4-D or dicamba. So what is a sufficient buffer? It depends. The onus is on the organic producer to prove to the certifier that the buffer can sufficiently protect the crop. There is no minimum requirement in the organic regulations. It just says that it has to be sufficient to protect against contamination. So physical buffers like tree lines can mean that a narrower buffer strip is allowable or in areas where a mowed grass buffer strip is in place, it might need to be a little bit wider. One thing to note is that harvested crop buffers are allowed in organics, which means that the buffer zone is actually a crop that gets harvested and sold at market. This would, the buffers are treated, harvested crop buffers are treated as conventional. So if an organic farm wants to harvest a crop off of their buffer zone, they must keep it segregated from the organic and sell it into the conventional markets. This is something that we very commonly see on farms that are going through transition, uh, have transition acres or are operating split operations. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of fields to kind of tease apart what would be a sufficient buffer. 
So on this field number one, we have on the west boundary an organic pasture, as well as a, a township road and a farmstead. To the north, we have conventional production. We have unmanaged woods to the to the east and conventional production with a farm lane to the south. So for field one, we would definitely need to have a buffer along the south edge because we have that conventional field adjacent to it. In this type of situation, oftentimes 25 feet or one header pass of a combine would be um, oftentimes considered sufficient. That will be down to the discretion of the inspector who comes on site and assesses whether that is a sufficient buffer based on actual infield conditions. Unmanaged woods um, is something that we often hear on organic inspections. I am an organic inspector and I'll hear from farmers, well, that's unmanaged woods, so I don't need to have a buffer on my field because there aren't any prohibited substances being applied. Very often, far, um, certifiers will accept unmanaged woods as a buffer in and of itself because there isn't any activity that is happening in there um, that would potentially risk contamination of the organic field. Unmanaged does not necessarily mean un, um, untended, but it means there isn't a crop being taken out of it where chemical applications would be uh, being placed. That doesn't mean that it can't be logged or something like that. Um, that's a, a kind of a, a, a sticky area, and it's going to come down to um, what documentation the farm has, whether they have a relationship with that landowner, and can substantiate that it, in fact, does not have any um, activity that would pose a risk of contamination. Along this north edge, we would definitely want a buffer, usually about 25 feet. Now, the case of this organic pasture on the west, we have a farm lane and that farm lane in and of itself could serve as a buffer. So we don't need to worry about a buffer up on the northwest corner. But along the boundary where we are right up against the pasture, as an inspector, I would ask the farm, how do you know that it is in fact organic? Is it certified organic? Who are the certifiers? And I could, look the op I could look the operation up in the Organic Integrity Database to verify that it is in fact certified organic. If it isn't certified organic, but it's managed organically, the farmer who is applying for certification for field one could ask the landowner of the organic pasture or the land manager of the organic pasture for an uh, adjoining land use affidavit, which it is a document that is signed by the manager of the adjacent field that attests that they don't use any prohibited substances that would pose a contamination risk to the field in question. If you have any questions as I'm going through here, do feel free to drop them into the chat. We will have time in a little bit for discussion and questions, but if you have questions that come up right away, I am watching the chat and I can answer them in real time if you drop them in there. So field number two, the, um, for this example, looking at field number two, we have a railroad track along the north. We have a thin tree line against conventional uh, production on the east, a county road against conventional production on the south and conventional production on the west with a county road and a homestead that is not managed by the manager of field two. So looking at this, <clears throat> the county roads would serve as sufficient buffer typically um, on the west and the south. If there are power lines, um, it would be, it is prudent to have the farmer talk with the power company to ensure that they will not uh, spray any chemicals to control brush underneath the power lines. On the east side, there would need to be a buffer, but it could probably be thinner than it would otherwise be because there is the physical buffer of the tree line. So instead of the full 25 feet, feet they might be able to get away with 10 or 15, depending on the prevailing winds. The railroad tracks are another difficult case. Many farmers will want to use railroad tracks as a buffer so that they don't have to take out space from their field. 
But with railroad tracks, they can oftentimes be aggressively managed by the railway companies with chemicals to keep the tracks clear of, shrub, of shrubs and plants and, and other plants. And so if the railroad track is a disused track, it's a pretty good buffer. Um, if it is an active track, it's a similar case as we were discussing with the power lines, where the farmer would need to um, have a discussion with the manager of the railroad tracks and determine whether they have any uh, prohibited substances that they will be applying. And our final buffer example here in field three, this field is going into vegetable production. We have organic pasture along the east and the south and managed by the same farmer, so no buffer would be needed there. But on the conventional pasture on the north and west, there may or may not need to be a buffer. If that conventional pasture is not treated with prohibited substances and the landowner is willing to provide a, an affidavit attesting to that, then no buffer would be needed. Otherwise, there would be a buffer needed. But in this case, the main risk concern posed is by this dry lot cattle situation. So one of the things that we have to protect against is um, contamination of the crop and not just by prohibited substances, but by microbes. And a little bit later, we will see information about manure regulations and application to human consumable crops. So in this dry lot cattle situation, there's going to be a lot of manure concentrated in that area. And when it rains, it will flow downhill. Well, and in this case, the slope we see indicates that it flows directly into this proposed organic field. That will be a problem for meeting the requirements of not having food contaminated by raw manure within a certain period of time prior to harvest. So that is a type of contamination that also needs to be taken in, into consideration. What crop is going to be grown and what water, what could the water that flows across the land be contaminated with? A buffer zone here that would be able to slow down that water and keep it from flowing directly into the crop area would help protect against contamination by that raw manure. So now this brings us to um, section 205-202A, which is um, about the types of practices that must be in place for, in place for farms to be certified organic. So they, the, each parcel must be managed in accordance with the following sections of the regulations. 205, 203, the soil fertility and crop nutrient practice standard states that farms must use tillage and cultivation practices that maintain or improve the physical, chemical, and biological condition of soil and minimize soil erosion. It must also manage crop nutrients and soil fertility through rotations, cover crops, and the application of plant and animal materials, and must manage plant and animal materials to maintain or improve soil organic matter content in a manner that does not contaminate the soil or the water. This provision, this regulation also states that soil fertility and crop nutrients must not be managed by burning as a means of disposal of crop residues, but you may burn in the, in the event of needing to germinate seeds or for disease control. So I'd like to point out the difference between must and may, because in subsequent slides, we will see the word may arise. In the organic regulations, there are many provisions that say must. Those are requirements and they have to be in place to be certified organic. Other provisions say may, which are options to be able to achieve the must regulations. So may is permissible, but not required. And must is required for certification. 
So the next section we're going to talk about are seeds. So section 205-204 state um, is the section that addresses seeds and planting stock used in organic production. Organic farms must use organic seed when that seed is commercially available. So in general, organic farms have to use organic seed, but they there is a a provision that allows for the use of non-organic seed in the event that the agronomic properties that the farmer needs of that crop are not available in an organic variety, or there isn't enough of the organic variety available for them to meet their production needs. So to use a non-organic variety, a farm must conduct an organic seed search. To do an organic seed search, they must call at least three companies that sell organic seed and ask for the required agronomic characteristics. So for example, I need a white corn with a certain level of hardness of the seed coat and a certain protein content. Or I need a soybean with certain day length to or cert, certain number of days to maturity and quick to canopy and a particular disease resistance. Those are examples of agronomic characteristics that can be searched for. The farmer must call at least three companies to satisfy this requirement, and they have to be companies that sell organic seed. So if a farmer calls, say, Pioneer and asks for white organic white corn with certain agronomic characteristics, that phone call to Pioneer wouldn't satisfy one of the three companies that they need to call because Pioneer does not sell organic varieties, period. So they obviously won't find an organic variety there. More information on this is available in NOP guidance document 5029, which can be easily found with uh, just searching guidance document NOP 5029. Um, some other requirements of non-organic varieties, they must be non-GMO. GMO is always prohibited in organics, and therefore, even if you're using a non-organic variety, you cannot have a genetically modified non-organic variety. And the seeds must not be coated or treated with prohibited substances. Seed treatments are allowed in organic. They just cannot be prohibited substances. So if you say buy a non-organic clover variety and it is treated with an allowable inoculant, that is a seed treatment that is allowed on a non-organic variety. But if you buy a non-organic non-GMO soybean that is treated um, with a pesticide, seed treatment that would disallow that seed and that would be a contamination of that field. I do see that we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, no tillers would say no tillage of any kind is how you maintain or improve soil health. How is tillage even allowed? Tillage is allowed in organics so long as it maintains or improves the soil um, organic matter and physical characteristics, which means it needs to be done judiciously. That means lighter, um, shallower tillage passes, fewer tillage passes, um, and also farms need to be doing other practices that help steward soil health in the face of tillage. This would be things like crop rotation, cover crop usage, really leaning on the, the principles of soil health also called the principles of regenerative agriculture, to be able to minimize disturbance and maximize soil health so that the soil is able to tolerate the necessary tillage in certain organic systems. Um, I'm happy to discuss that further later on in the, in the talk if there are further questions. Uh, the next question, are transitional farms required to use organic seed or can they use non-GMO, non-treated conventional seed in transition years? They can use non-GMO, non-treated, um, non-prohibited substance treated conventional seed. So during transition, there is not a requirement to use organic seed. So 205, 205, the crop rotation practice standard. Organic farms are required to have a crop rotation in place. And section 205-205 lays out exactly four specific outcomes that the crop rotation must achieve. 
The crop rotation must maintain or improve soil organic matter content. The crop rotation must provide for pest management in annual and perennial crops. It must manage deficient or excess plant nutrients. Apologize, there's a, a typo there. C should say plant nutrients and must provide erosion control. So um, for Teresa, this is exactly in the regulations where it calls out practices that have to be in place to help steward in the face of tillage. So crop rotation has to achieve those four outcomes. So what, what's the definition of a crop rotation though? According to 205.2, definition of crop rotation is the practice of alternating the annual crops grown in a specific field in a planned pattern or sequence in successive crop years so that crops of the same species or family are not repeated without interruption on the same field. So a question for you all, breaking that down, could a organic producer grow corn in this year and corn next year? Would that be meeting the definition of a crop rotation? Feel free to unmute and weigh in. Anybody have opinions on whether corn on corn is allowed in organic? Um, hey, Mallory, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, this is Teresa chiming in again. What if you grew a cover crop between your corn on corn? Would that Excellent be considered question. a crop rotation or not? If you snuck in winter rye between. Excellent suggestion. Because I would say corn on corn is not a great rotation um, to improve soil health and to meet all the requirements of organic agriculture. But I have worked with people who will try to fit cover crops in and say that's part of the crop rotation. But is it? Excellent suggestion. So let's break it down. We have corn in one year, corn the next year, broken up by cereal rye. So looking at the crop rotation definition, we have the same species grown in successive years, but it is interrupted by another species. So per 205.2, we have met the crop rotation definition. But let's look at our 205.205 outcomes that a crop rotation must meet. So the, my next question to you all, corn, rye, corn, will that meet these four outcomes over time? Anyone have any thoughts about whether corn broken up by rye will maintain or improve soil organic matter content, provide for pest management, manage deficient nutrients? I think it is a little weak. This is Teresa again. Mm -hmm. I agree that it's weak. So. What I have seen as an inspector is um, I have seen a rotation of corn, rye, or corn, tillage radish, corn. But what the organic certifier required was that it wasn't repeated a third year. So in circumstances where, say, a farm is bringing in new um, acres into transition and their balance of acres between their crops is getting skewed and they need to kind of reset the rotation, a year like this would likely be allowed by the certifier. But if it were to go on for a third year or forbid a fourth year, then we're getting into question of whether, as Kenneth says in the, in the chat, grass after grass, where you have corn grass and rye grass, is not gonna break up pest and weed disease cycles sufficiently. And it's definitely going to not feed that corn crop. We're gonna be end up, end up in a cycle of relying on ever more applications of manure. So that would be an example of where a crop rotation would be meeting the definition of crop rotation, but not 
necessarily meeting the crop rotation practice standard. I see that Lacey has asked a question. Say a company offers their own forage seed or cover crop mixture that is unique to the company. Is the seed search the same when they know that no other company will have the same mix? Are they required to make their own mix with the individual organic components if they are available? That is an excellent question, and I don't have a clean cut answer to, to that. I think that will come down to the interpretation by um, individual certifying uh, agencies. My gut says that the farm would need to try to source the components um, to be able to plant the mix that they want with organic. But I will say that in my experience, many cover crop varieties, there is a, 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 a shortage of availability in organics. And so they may end up being able to buy that, um, that mix with non-organic varieties regardless because they aren't able to source um, an organic variety of particular cover crops that they want to plant. Okay, um, pressing forward, I'm going to um, speed up just a little bit because we're behind where I would like to be at this point. Um, so 205-206 covers the crop, pest, weed, and disease management practice standard. And the big takeaway from 205-206 is that farms must use preventive management strategies before applying substances for pest, weed, and disease control. So in organics, we do have allowable inputs that can control for pests, weeds, and diseases, but the farms must use preventive management before they apply those. So they essentially have to have a demonstrated need for it. So they have to have in place strategies such as crop rotation, sanitation measures to remove disease vectors and weed seeds and habitat for pests, and cultural practices that enhance the crop health, including things like um, selecting plant species and varieties that are suited to the site-specific conditions and have inherent pest, weed, and disease um, resistance. So I'm going to quickly breeze through livestock. Um, point of just disclosure, I am a crops girl. Livestock is outside of my deep expertise. I do know the regulations, but if we have um, deep questions about livestock, I may have to follow up with you and connect, connect you offline with somebody who can get that question answered. So livestock, um, requirements for um, the origin of livestock. This is the livestock version of you have to plant organic seed, meaning that in general, livestock animals on an organic operation must, must be managed continuously as organic to be able to be sold as organic. So for broiler operations or layer operations, that means that the poultry must be managed organically from the second day of life. So they can buy hatch, hatch chicks from a conventional hatchery so long as from the second day of life, those chicks are raised organically, then they can be sold as organic slaughter stock or organic eggs coming from those chickens. Breeder stock for, um, for slaughter operations must be um, managed organically from the last third of gestation. So say you buy a replacement cow and you wanna sell the calf that she is pregnant with as organic slaughter stock, as long as that calf was, uh, as long as the cow was managed organically from the last third of gestation, that calf is organic. Um, and then dairy, dairy has a, a special case. Dairies can only transition animals once. Now dairies, unlike the rest of the livestock industry, have a very long lived livestock animal. In poultry, we're looking at six to eight weeks for, for broilers. For, um, for beef operations, we're looking at a couple of years. Dairy, you're looking at multiple couple of years. And so um, dairies will, when a dairy comes into organic, if they already have a conventional herd, they can transition those animals. But once they are organic and they have transitioned animals one time, they cannot purchase 
um, conventional animals and transition them again. They have to purchase organic animals or they have to raise organic animals as their replacement uh, dairy cows. Um, livestock feed must be organic and ruminant livestock must be allowed to graze during the grazing season. They cannot be actively um, uh, restrained from grazing during the grazing season, except in certain reasonable circumstances, which we'll get to in a minute, um, such as health checks and things like that and milking. Um, also, ruminant livestock must not be fed more than 70% of their dry matter intake from non-pasture grazed sources during the grazing season. Um, and they must graze a minimum of 120 days per year. And finally, pasture must be of sufficient size to meet that 30% dry matter intake from grazing. So you can't use the loophole of, well, I don't have enough pasture for the head count that I have, therefore I can't graze. Well, no, that means you need to reduce your head count. Um, the one exception to this are bulls. Bulls are exempt from the pasture and the um, dry matter intake requirement so long as they are not sold as organic slaughter stock. So if you have a bull, you need to keep it segregated. That bull can be segregated and um, put, put to the side and fed organic feed, but not necessarily meeting the uh, pasture requirements. As long as that when the bull has uh, lived its useful life, it's not sold as organic slaughter stock. It would have to be sold in the conventional market. Livestock health practice standard. Um, just like with crop health and livestock health, you must use preventative management practices. You also cannot sell animals that have been treated with organic with antibiotics as organic. You can't administer a drug in the absence of illness, except for vaccines. No growth hormones in organics, and in um, no routine use of synthetic parasiticide. I can't say that word, parasiticides. Um, I want to emphasize, though there are restrictions on being able to sell an animal as organic once it has been treated with certain medications and antibiotics, in organic, it also is emphatically prohibited to withhold medical treatment from sick animals in an effort to maintain organic status. If an animal is sick, it must be treated and then it has to be sold into the conventional market. It has lost its organic status. Livestock living conditions must accommodate the natural behavior of animals. Um, there must be year round access to outdoors, including shade, shelter, exercise areas, et cetera, all suitable to the species, stage of life, climate, and environment. All of that is subject to the verification of the inspector. So the inspector will be the one who looks at it and says, this appears to be suitable to the species and stage of life in consultation with the certifier. Um, you can temporarily deny animals access to the outdoors due to things like inclement weather, risk to soil or water quality, among other reasonable circumstances. So if there is a major thunderstorm coming through, you absolutely can keep your livestock safe and put them inside. If there has been a, a flooding event and it would risk contamination to surface water to turn your cow, cows out to pasture, you can keep them temporarily confined to protect soil and water quality. Um, bedding for uh, livestock must be organic and uh, livestock operations must manage manure, pasture and other outdoor areas in a manner that does not put soil or water quality at risk. Pasture is considered a, uh, is considered cropland in organic and must be managed according to the organic crop practices. So in addition to all the pasture requirements for feeding and housing livestock, pasture also has to meet all of those crop requirements that we have already discussed. With that, we have come to the point of the session where I would like us to do the regulation scavenger hunt. So I am going to have you um, assigned to breakout rooms um, in just a moment. 
in the chat, I have sent you a link to the activity and also shared for a second time the link to the organic regulations. So this activity is um, will take about 10 minutes uh, for you to, to get together in a breakout group. And as a group, you're going to go through five questions that are based on the organic regulations. For each of the questions, provide your answer, explain your reasoning, and provide the citation that backs up your answer. Um, we'll take 10 minutes to go over five questions. So that's about two minutes per question. In each of your groups, please assign one person to be the scribe who will download that activity and type in the group's answers, and then assign one person to be the group reporter. The scribe and the reporter can be the same person if your group chooses. The job of the reporter is going to be to speak for your breakout group when we come back together in 10 minutes um, to go over the answers to the questions. So with that, go ahead, download the activity from the chat, open up the organic regulations, and I am going to queue up the breakout rooms. It'll take me just one minute to uh, get the breakout rooms assigned. Okay, you all are going into your break room, breakout rooms. All right, welcome back everyone. Okay, so we have just completed the regulation scavenger hunt. Hopefully you all were able to get to all five questions. I recognize some of you, one of the groups or both may not have gotten through all the questions. Um, I would like to go through each of the questions and have the reporter um, for each of the groups um, weigh in on kind of what you all decided was um, the answer. So we'll start with number one, and then I'll call on, um, who is the reporter from the group that Sage was in? Sage is the reporter. Who was the reporter for the group that Timber was in? Teresa? Okay, great. So I'll call on Sage and Teresa when the time comes. So okay. question number one. Field C, heady and hydrous ammonia applied on November 10th, 2021, assuming no prohibited substances are applied after that date. Can the yellow corn crop planted in spring of 24 be harvested as organic? Explain your reasoning. Um, Stage, why don't you kick off? What, uh, what conclusion does your group come to? As long as the harvest date is past the period in which they began their transition period, it would be okay. And it would be able to be certified as organic. What would that date be? It would be November 11th, 2024. Okay. And uh, did you come up with a citation to support your answer? Uh, we we were going to go back and get the citations to make sure we hit okay. up all the questions. We do not have that now, but I can find it in a second. Sorry. Teresa, okay. did your group come up? Uh, did your group agree with that answer? We agree, and we spent. We did go back, and that it, it kind of took a while to find mm -hmm. the right citation. So we what got tied you... up with uh, 205.202 land yes. requirements, and uh, specifically um, subsection B. So 205.202 B would be the correct citation. Excellent. All right. Question number two: A farmer runs a split operation and uses the same equipment for both the conventional and organic crops. A grain cart has just returned from the elevator after delivering a load of conventional grain. A rainstorm is about 30 minutes away and time is of the essence. Can the farmer load an organic crop straight into that grain cart and get it to the bin before the rain hits? Teresa, your group, what did you come up with? We felt that the answer is no, they cannot. It needs to be cleaned out, but we, ne we didn't find a citation to back that up yet. Okay. Great, Sage. Did your group? What did your group say? Yeah, we we agreed uh, with all of that. Okay, so yes, it it can't it correct. It cannot be put straight into that bin into that grain cart. It must be cleaned out in between. So if they can properly clean it out in that turnaround time, they could use the same grain cart. The citation you could use would be two hundred five dot two seven two a. And that is in the contamination and commingling section of the 
um, regulations. Question three, is intensive tillage that causes wind erosion allowable in organics? Sage, what did your group come up with? I thought this one was kind of an interesting question because depending on the overall system itself, I feel like a farmer could argue that it is acceptable depending on the necessity of those tillage practices. Um, they could alter those tillage practices, but if they have other conservation practices built into their farming system plan that is able to essentially do the, the net gain or the soil building aspect of the organic stipulations, I don't know where it would be. So like, I feel like the answer is supposed to be a no, but I could see it being a yes. I guess. Okay, thanks, Sage. Good, good fodder for discussion. Teresa's group, what did you guys come up with? And like, have a. We were still kind of talking about this, but I'll just take one for the team. I think if you look at 205.203 soil fertility and crop nutrient practice standards, you must maintain, um, you know, the soil health or that whole till it and that's one area that we could probably talk for a while on but i would say intensive tillage should be a no because you are destroying the soil health and destroying soil organic matter and a whole bunch of stuff so i would say no but i think it's done because tillage is the main form of weed control for a lot of organic farmers okay great great answers so my answer to this is no wind erosion if you're if you're having wind erosion then you're you're not stewarding the soil now i can see sage's argument about the word intensive tillage because intensive tillage could mean an intensive tillage pass in the in the uh in the context of other soil health practices but the other soil health practices should be preventing that wind erosion. Like you should be tilling at a time of year and with a tillage type that may be considered intensive as a pass, but it's done in a way that it prevents wind erosion. Like you're immediately seeding a crop or a cover crop into that field, getting it covered as quickly as possible, et cetera. Um, 205, 203A is what I have down as the citation. All right, the next question. Raw and... Oops, raw animal manure was applied to field 102 on March 6th. Is it allowable for the farmer to harvest the organic romaine lettuce crop from that field on July 23rd? Um, Teresa, did your group get to this question? We didn't. Wasn't it 90 days though? Or there is, you'd have to be careful with that one because you could get E. coli or other mm -hmm. issues. Correct. But we didn't come up with a team answer. Okay. Sage, did your group get to this question? We did. Um, two, 205.23C1 is what I would reference because, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the 90 or 120 days, depending. Um, is it a sufficient period? I believe so. I didn't actually like see if it fit within the time frame, but I do know that. As long as, yes, it is outside of that 90-day period, then... So is it 90-day period? For romaine lettuce? No, 120 for days. 120. Days for so for human consumable crops where the consumable portion of the crop comes in contact with the soil is a 120 day period for human consumable crops where the consumable part does not come in contact with the soil something like wheat it's 90 days so in this case it would be 120 days which 120 days from march 6th is july 4th so this crop would not be able to be harvested as organic until july 4th all right final question so organic soybeans were harvested from lower meadow field in early December 22. The weather was too cold and wet to plant the planned cereal rye cover crop, so the field was left fallow through the winter. In spring 2023, the field was again planted to organic soybeans. Is this crop sequence allowed in organics? I'm going to bypass too much conversation now in lieu of time because we talked about that earlier with our corn, rye, corn. So the answer is <laughs> no, you must have different crops or be interrupted by a different crop. So if they miss planting that rye crop, they can't plant that soybean. And we can even argue whether they should be planting the soybean in the third place. <laughs> so uh, first time it happens, usually you, you can get away with it. But later on down the line, those four objectives for uh, 205, 205 for crop rotation 
will come into play. All right, I am going to share my screen to finish up the presentation today with allowable and prohibited substances. So bear with me for one second while I do all of the necessary clicking. All right, so allowable and prohibited substances in organic. The sections that uh, cover this are are called the national list of allowed and prohibited substances. So generally in organics, non-synthetic substances, also sometimes referred to as natural, those substances are generally allowed. So if something is non-synthetic, which means it is from a mind source or it is from a biologically derived source like plant matter, or it is from a natural source that does not undergo a chemical process to be created in, say, a lab, those are allowed. Synthetic substances are prohibited, generally. That's your general rule of thumb. If, if it's synthetic, no. If it's non-synthetic, aka natural, yes. The national list is a section of the regulations that outlines the exceptions to those rules of thumb. So synthetic substances that are present on the national list are allowed because it's the exception. And non-synthetic substances that are on the list are prohibited because it's the exception. So for example, almost all micronutrients that we have available to apply to crops are derived from synthetic, synthetic lab-based processes, and those are allowed. They are on the synthetic substances allowed list. Arsenic is a natural substance, but it's prohibited because it is on the national list for non-synthetic substances that are prohibited. One of the great challenges in organics is knowing whether or not something that you want to apply to your crop is allowed. A great great resource is the OMRI database. OMRI stands for Organic Materials Review Institute. They are a nonprofit that maintains a very robust database of substances um, that have been reviewed by them and their scientist experts to determine whether or not they are allowed in organic. This is an authoritative source. If it is in the OMRI database, and it is stated that it is allowed, then you can be confident that it is allowed. One of the great things about the OMRI database is that it lists proprietary products. The national list in the regulations does not. The national list only lists base ingredients, base substances, but mixes and proprietary substances um, that you could buy as a product are not on the national are not addressed directly in the organic regulations but omri for a fee will review the process that is used to create a product and all of its ingredients and determine whether or not it meets the regulations and if it does then it will be listed in the um, database so this is an example search for a um, biofungicide by marone bio um, called Pace Setter. And you can see that it is uh, um, an allowed product. So there are three categories of status for, for substances to be applied in organics. Allowed, which means it's allowed under all conditions. Allowed with restrictions, which means the, the substance itself is allowed. It's not prohibited, but you can only use it under certain conditions or once certain parameters have been followed. And then prohibited, which means it is never allowed. Prohibited is, prohibited is the big bad. If that happens, you have a problem with your organic compliance. So let's look at some examples of allowed substances. Um, allowed substances are anything that is non-synthetic, AKA natural, that is not on the national list. This would be things like wood chips, straw, molasses. All of these are derived from natural substances using natural processes and are allowed with no restrictions. Now, certain things are allowed but carry restrictions. We've already talked about animal manure. Raw animal manure is allowed in organic and it can come from a um, from a 
um, conventional farm, a conventional source of manure, because digestion is considered a transformative process. And so conventional um, hogs and conventional chickens, you can gather their manure up and spread it on organic farms, but there are restrictions associated with it. The um, It has to be applied uh, within that 90 or 100, 120 day window, and also in a manner that doesn't contaminate the soil or water. Another example of um, a substance that's allowed with restrictions, Chilean nitrate, aka sodium nitrate. The restriction that it bears is that it's um, prohibited unless the use is restricted to no more than 20% of the crop's total nitrogen requirement. So you can't apply a bunch of Chilean nitrate. You can't rely on it for as the sole source of nitrogen for that crop. One thing to be aware of though, if a farm uses Chilean nitrate or AKA sodium nitrate, it, it's allowed under the NOP regulations, but it is not allowed under the Canadian or EU regulations. And therefore they wouldn't be able to sell to a buyer who wanted to export. Um, they wouldn't be able to get a Canadian equivalency on their certificate. Another example of allowed with restrictions, as I said before, synthetic, uh, synthetic micronutrients are um, uh, allowed, but the restriction says there must be a documented deficiency. That documented deficiency could be met by any number of means, including um, soil tests, tissue tests, or um, for certain deficiencies, um, classic symptomology would be uh, permissible. Um, Soap-based herbicides are, an, are allowed for use in organics, but the restriction is for use on in farmstead maintenance. You can't use it on the crop fields. Another example is copper hydroxide, oxide or oxychloride. It must be used as a plant disease control, and it must be done in a way that doesn't accumulate in the soil. So those are examples of restrictions that are placed on allowed substances. Now, prohibited substances are anything that isn't natural and is not on the exceptions list for synthetics. In addition to those broad categories, prohibited um, certain prohibited items that are called out directly in the regulations, sewage sludge or biosolids, ionizing radiation, uh, treated lumber for new installations or replacements. So if a, if a livestock operation needs to install a new fence, if they have a transition, they can, they can do it using treated lumber, but if they have transition, they cannot use treated lumber. Um, ash from manure burning is always prohibited. Rotenone and strychnine are also prohibited naturals. Excluded methods are also prohibited. This is, this is where we get into the prohibition on GMOs. So genetic modification is a prohibited method. It is not a considered a substance, it's a method. Um, watch out for terms like biotechnology enhanced. That is a sign that it would be prohibited. Um, also watch out for microbial inoculants. A lot of inoculants are derived from genetically engineered microbe stock. So um, genetically engineered um, microorganisms are also prohibited. Um, they can be in inoculants, they can be a pest control, they can be in livestock feed. So there's something to watch out for. And then also the very common, commonly known GMO seeds are prohibited. Every ingredient in a mix or in a product counts. So uh, a natural product can become synthetic if it is treated with a chemical process or have synthetics added to it in the product mix. Examples are hydrolysis. That is a synthetic process that is prohibited. Also pelletizers and dust suppressants and fertilizers are oftentimes prohibited substances, even though the active ingredient is allowed. Um, pit stabilizers and hog manure, that is a big one, um, especially around confinement facilities where they want to be accessing that manure. If synthetic prohibited pit stabilizers are added, then that hog manure has become contaminated by a prohibited substance and itself is now prohibited. Um, solvent extraction is also a, um, a method, uh, a synthetic process 
that can be applied to a natural substance that then makes it prohibited. We don't have time to do this activity that I planned for, but I do want to um, draw your attention to the Transition to Organic Partnership Program run by USDA NOP. There are lots of resources that are being generated by this program. There are mentor matching, there are workforce development, there's endless education all across the country that is being funded over the next four years. We're coming to a close of the first of five years. So four more years of this program, you can visit everything talk at organic transition.org. Um, with that, I thank you all so much. I will stick around to answer any questions about material inputs that anyone has, but in respect of the time that we set for today, if you need to go, I totally understand. And thank you so much for being here. If you have any questions, I can be reached at Mallory at organicagronomy.org, or you can visit the OATS website, organicagronomy.org. So with that, thank you all very much. And if you have a question, feel free to unmute and ask it, and I'll stick around for a few minutes.